Hey everyone, um, let's do another video lecture. Uh, so we're going to do the lipids video this time. Uh, last time we looked at carbohydrates, we're going to look at lipids, we'll look at amino acids, and then we can start um, building up a better picture of what's going on uh, inside our bodies. So lipids are fats, and they're essentially hydrophobic or, or water-hating substances. Um, so we're going to look at some classifications of those. All right, so as far as the classifications go, there's going to be our fatty acids, uh, which include triglycerides, sphingolipids. Uh, these are phosphoacylglycerides, or glycerols, uh, and glycolipids. We'll see some vitamins that are lipid-soluble meaning they're fat-soluble vitamins, um, and uh, these are essentially the ones that are not essential vitamins because uh, we can store them. Uh, there are some that are water-soluble that we actually lose every day because uh, we pass a lot of water through our bodies and it washes out our vitamins. Um, we're going to see some prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and thromba uh, thromboxanes towards the end of the chapter. Um, these are derivatives of a particular fatty acid called arachidonic acid. Um, and then we're going to see uh, a separate class of uh, lipids that includes cholesterol, steroid hormones, and bile acids. Um, so essentially a few different kinds here. Um, again, going back to this first category, fatty acids are the simplest ones. We're going to see waxes also not included on this list. That's included in the slides, but not on this list. Uh, and then slightly more complex, we'll have triacylglycerides or triglycerides. And there's some old terms. Triacylglyceride is another term. It means the same thing as triglyceride. Um, sphingolipids we're going to see are similar, but they have a slightly different backbone. Uh, phosphoglycerides have a phosphate group on them. And then glycolipids have sugars attached. So that's what all these terms mean. So simplest, uh, well, I guess we're not going to start with the simplest. We're going to start with a triglyceride. So a, a triglyceride is what happens when we take the alcohol uh, in glycerol and react it with the carboxylic acid group from the fatty acids. We've seen carboxylic acids before. And in fact, we've even seen the long chain ones when we were looking at esters and that kind of stuff uh, when, when we did our carboxylic acid chapter. So these are fatty acids, these guys up here, fatty acids. Um, triglycerides are what we get when glycerol, which happens to be a triol, and this is not the structure of glycerol, uh, triol reacts with three fatty acids. We get something called a triglyceride. Now, uh, two or three different fatty acid components are present. That's because sometimes we have three different or the same fatty acids, and sometimes we have two with something else uh, bonded to that third position, and that might be, let's say, a phosphate group. Um, these guys are hydrophobic mostly. It depends on if it gets the phosphate group or not. Um, but they're mostly hydrophobic, so very greasy, very non-water loving, and we'll tend to see them as actually part of the membranes um, that, that our cells use to separate, you know, different water components from each other. Um, so let's take a look at the actual structure here. So uh, triglycerides. So tri because there's three different fatty acids. Uh, the hydroxyl group uh, of the glycerol is where that other name comes from, triglyceride from the glycerol molecule. That's the alcohol that's reacting with the fatty acids. Um, and what you're seeing here are three different fatty acids. We have stearate, which uh, if you remember the terminology from the, the carboxylic acids chapter, um, this one uh, means it has 18 carbons and zero double bonds, so it's completely saturated hydrocarbons, or fatty acids. Um, this palmitate here, also, no double bonds. But this oleate over here, 
18 carbons and one double bond. And so that double bond is going to put a kink into this chain here. And we'll, we'll talk about the significance of that in a few seconds. So this is a triglyceride. And these fatty acids can all be different. They can all be the same. Um, different sources of fats will have different fatty acids in them. Um, and I think there's a chart in our book or possibly in this slide that'll show that. So what all fatty acids have in common, so these are the fatty acids, now the simple lipids, um, the building blocks essentially of the triglycerides, is that they are all unbranched. They range in size from about 10 to 20 carbons. In our triglycerides, they're all going to have even numbers. And that comes from the fact that when they get put together um, by organisms, um, they come from acetyl groups that are just two carbon groups. So they, they get built in two carbons at a time. So this is why they're usually even. Um, apart from the COOH group, they'll have no functional groups on them. So they won't have um, nitrogens or hydroxyls, but they may have double bonds. And if they do have double bonds, they're going to be the cis double bond. That's when we get something that creates a kink in the chain as opposed to a trans double bond, which we'll talk about in a second for a different reason, uh, that doesn't put a kink in the chain. So it's almost like a, an unsaturated, right? All right, so triglycerides, we talk about them in terms of their melting points. We talk about them in terms of whether they're solid or liquid at room temperature. Um, triglycerides that come from animal sources tend to be solids at room temp for the most part. And uh, triglycerides that come from plants tend to be liquid at room temp for the most part. There are exceptions. Um, we call the plant ones, the ones that are liquid at room temp, we call them oils. The ones that are solid, the ones from animals, we call fats. But really it's all about do their um, hydrocarbon chains, do their fatty acid, you know, carbon chains, are they double bonded? And if they are, are they cis double bonded versus trans double bonded? Um, and so if they can pack together and, and form, you know, a lot of, uh, of those hydrophobic interactions with each other, then they tend to have higher melting points. This is the same thing that we already know about saturated alkanes. Saturated alkanes have higher boiling points. As we introduce um, unsaturation or double bonds into these fatty acid chains, they add kinks. Remember, uh, without kinks, they're like Pringles that can pack together, but with kinks, now they can't pack together. And so they tend to not have as strong of interactions with each other, and they can start to melt at earlier temperatures, lower temperatures, and they would also boil at lower temperatures as well. Um, hardening is what they call uh, taking an oil and making it more solid. So uh, if you have any olive oil spread in your refrigerator, um, it's, it's not just that they've taken your olive oil and chilled it and that's why it's solid. They've actually reduced some of those, um, those double bonds away. They've gotten rid of some of those double bonds and turned them back into saturated bonds, uh, which again, raises the melting point of the solution of that stuff of, of that oil. And so, um, that process is called hydrogenation. And usually, um, you partially hydrogenate because if you've hydrogenated it too much, it becomes too hard. Um, and so these, this partial hydrogenation is actually what introduces something called a trans double bond. And those trans fats, those trans double bonds, um, those are bad for us because they, uh, you know, they, they don't prevent the packing together of the oils. And so they, they can harden up um, inside your arteries and they can you know, clog your, uh, your arteries in that sense. Um, okay. Triglycerides can also be hydrolyzed they have ester bonds. And so we know that ester bonds can hydrolyze back into uh, a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. 
And so um, the, the most effective way of hydrolyzing triglycerides is actually using base, base hydrolysis. And we know that that's called saponification. We've already talked about um, this process of making soap and how a soap molecule is basically the, the fatty acid that has that polar head group, the, the carboxylic acid side, um, and then the long fatty acid chain side. Um, and that's what this is. This is this is how soaps are made, from oils or from fat. All right. So, simple lipids are fatty acids and waxes. I actually just realized I didn't show you a wax. So waxes are just long chain esters. They come from long chain alcohols reacting with long chain fatty acids, um, and they look like that. <laughs> Waxes. Um, it might be in this slide. I, I, didn't, I don't recall seeing it later on. I thought it would be right here in this section with simple lipids. Uh, waxes are generally made by plants um, as coatings, protective coatings for their leaves and for their uh, fruits and that kind of stuff. Um, it keeps the water out, keeps bugs out keeps everything fresh inside. Um, so, so those are simple lipids, fatty acids and waxes. Complex lipids are triglycerides, which are combinations of glycerol with fatty acids. Um, and then phospholipids, which are glycerols that have two fatty acids on them uh, and a phosphate group. And, and here's where you can kind of, depends on how you say it. If you talk about phosphoglycerides, uh, or glycerophospholipids, then this specifically means a glycerol molecule. If you just say phospholipids, well then it technically can contain any kind of alcohol. It might be a sphingosine. Sphingosine is an alcohol. Um, it might, uh, it just means that it also has a, a phosphate group on it, phospholipids. Um, and so the one specifically that I was talking about two seconds ago um, is this glycerophospholipid. Uh, with the glycerol molecule, we can kind of draw that. C, C, C. It's got some H2 on it. It has that uh, fatty acid. Oh, walk this way. This guy's the same. And then in the third position, it's got this phosphate. And that phosphate group is usually also ester bonded to some other kind of alcohol. Uh, and we'll talk about the differences there in, in, a, in a minute or two. Um, so this is a glycerophospholipid. It's got the glycerol molecule, it's got two fatty acids, and then it has this phosphate group. Now, sphingolipids are gonna be lipids that contain sphingosine. Uh, we'll see what that looks like in a minute. And then glycolipids, are lipids that have carbohydrates on them. Um, and they might be um, glycero uh, glycolipids, they might be sphingoglycolipids. So the backbone, the alcohol um, could vary depending on what their function is in the body. We're not gonna go that deep into it. So you can kind of see the, uh, the general layout here. I thought waxes were on here, they're not even on here. They are in your book though. So simple also has waxes. And then complex, we have the phospholipids that just simply contain a phosphate group. We have the glycero phospholipids that have glycerol and the sphingolipids that have sphingosine. And then we have glycolipids. Um, and the ones your book is gonna focus on are those that have a sphingosine backbone and some kind of sugar. So we'll take a look at a few. And, and then, by the way, to mention, this is one category of lipids. The other category are the steroid lipids that have different structures altogether. So that's where we're going down the road with this. Um, many of these lipids are used in membranes. They're part of the, the lipid bilayer that separates the inside of cells from the outside of cells. Um, they're, they're used um, within cells as 
um, other membrane enclosed organelles like we have we have um, something called a, a, a peroxisome which is a little little ball of digestive enzymes that floats around within a cell and it's protected from the rest of the cell by a, by a lipid layer. Anyways, a lot of these um, molecules are, are perfect for that because they have polar head groups, they have nonpolar tail groups, and they can arrange into those, those little circular sort of uh, micelles that soap molecules will do where all the little tails point in away from the water on the outside, you know, and then the inside is very, very nonpolar and nonpolar things can, can hide out in there. So it's a cool little mechanism that nature came up with. So found in the lipid bilayers and we're going to see a, uh, a, an arrange, uh, a picture right now in a second. Um, the arrangement of the hydrocarbon tails in the interior can be rigid, meaning they can pack together very, very nicely. This is the case with lots of saturated fats with no double bonds. Or it can be more fluid, more flexible, more um, loosely packed if it has unsaturated fats. And we're going to see that even some of the steroid lipids have a role to play in, in making the membrane more fluid or less fluid. So this is called the fluid mosaic model because uh, mosaic, because when you look down from the top, it kind of looks like a mosaic, like the different colors, um, all the little different pieces sort of um, moving around, all the proteins embedded in there and all the little things, um, kind of like a, like a tile mosaic. Now fluid, because everything does move around. Uh, this protein right here is a membrane protein. All of these, this little, region of it is all nonpolar amino acids that like the nonpolar tails that are nearby of those um, um, triglycerides or these phospholipids and um, <coughs> excuse me they're not triglycerides they're phospholipids the triglycerides aren't polar enough so it's the phosphate the phosphate group um, that's very charged and that's what's what's on the outside of this this membrane here um, anyways, um, this, this protein can float around. It can move this way, it can move that way, it can interact with this protein, and this one can move you know, deeper into the picture, away where we can't see it, or towards us. So that's why it's fluid. Um, and you can see a lot of stuff going on here. There are proteins that kind of just interact on the inside of a cell. There are proteins that have little bits that stick out that have... Um, sugars on them that are usually involved in some kind of signaling or letting cells talk to each other. Um, this is a protein that hangs out on just the outside of the cell, or uh, I mean on the outside of the bilayer. This happens to be, I think, the inside of the cell, but it's um, on the outside of this you know, lipid bilayer, and it's called a peripheral protein. Um, integral pro proteins are the ones that actually span the distance uh, of the bilayer, and these are often involved in some kind of transport. Usually, they make um, like like this one, this one right over here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Looks like there's like you know six or seven little columns there that all just arrange to make a passageway that molecules can move in and out of the cell. So, this is the picture of what we think the the, the membranes of our cells look like, and these different. Um, these different um, phospholipids and glycerolipids and glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids, um, they play a role in that some of them have kinked chains um, to add more fluidity. Some of them have sugar groups on them. Some of them are attached um, to sphingosine molecules, which we tend to find more in certain brain cells. So just region specific. Um, but that's the big picture here is that they they all play different roles within this fluid membrane of the cell. We're just classifying the different general types that we see. So the glycerophospholipids, also called phosphoglycerides, uh, second most abundant group of naturally occurring lipids. 
exclusively found in plants and animal membranes, so not in bacteria. 40 to 50 percent of phosphoacylglycerols and 50 to 60 percent proteins. So um, that's in the previous picture, right? The purple and yellow things are the phosphoglycerols and the other things are the proteins. So this, you know, um, these glycerophospholipids are, are pretty abundant, basically. Um, they come from phosphatidic acid. You don't necessarily need to, to know that or see the reaction for that. Um, let's see here. It doesn't tell us how... Oh, there we go. Three most abundant fatty acids in the phosphatidic acids are the palmitic, the stearic, and the oleic. And notice that they are, for the most part, unsaturated with one being, uh, oh, sorry, saturated with one being unsaturated. Now, these are just the most common. It all just depends on how much of each you have. And I was mentioning that different sources, like co coconut oil, may have a higher percentage of oleic acid in it than the others, leading to it being more liquid at room temperature, whereas, um, you know, the fats, the oils that we find in some kind of animal source might be higher in the stearic acid, leading to it being more saturated. So these are just the most abundant fatty acids, but it's their ratios um, that actually determines if something is going to be liquid or solid at room temp. So this is just an example of a specific glycerophospholipid. Uh, glycero, again, because it has the glycerol molecule, phospho, because it has the phosphate group, um, and then um, the two fatty acids here in this case are oleic and palmitic. Um, and again, this is why this is perfect for the lipid bilayer. It's got a big nonpolar, probably could have excluded that double bonded O there, big nonpolar section and then a polar section. Or I should have drawn it as a circle since that's what those lipid bilayers kind of look like. All right. Glycerophospholipids look just like fats in the sense that they have um, the long hydrocarbon chain. Um, and this is just telling us some of the details that I just told you about that molecule. Um, and then here we go. This is where, um, depending on what's attached to this phosphate, we get some further classification. So if the alcohol that bonds to this, um, this phosphate group, that forms an ester bond with that phosphate group, if that happens to be choline, which is an amino alcohol, amino because it has this nitrogen on it, um, and also it had an OH group, um, uh, here it is right here. This is choline. If choline happens to be the alcohol attached to that phosphate group, it's called a lecithin. Um, so that's just the, the name that it's given. Um, there are others. If it has um, <coughs> ethanolamine or serine, um, then it's classified as a cephalin. And they're just um, different names for the different um, amino alcohols or the different alcohols that are attached to those phosphate groups. Um, it doesn't really matter what the fatty acids are, um, but they tend to have a different role physiologically. Remember, these little bits here are sticking up um, in those phosphate bilayers. So it would be that these little groups would be here. And so depending on what they are, they're going to have different roles. So here's one, uh, this is a nice little model, just showing like a space filling version of that lipid bilayer. So you can see that how the kinks in these chains here actually prevent these guys from getting too close to each other. And so um, if these chains were all to be perfectly straight and saturated, then this distance would close and this would become less fluid. So here is the that other group I was mentioning, cephalins. Um, if we have ethanolamine or serine attached uh, on that phosphate, we get two different um, phospholipids. All right. 
sphingolipids. Now, where glycerol was the alcohol that reacted with the fatty acids and the phosphates to make um, glycerol, uh, uh, the triacylglycerols and the uh, glycerophospholipids, sphingolipids have sphingosine. And so this, this here is sphingosine. Now, the, the similarity is that where glycerol, I'm going to try to draw it kind of next to it here. Let's see, one carbon, two carbon, three carbon. All right, so glycerol had an OH, and then it had an OH here. So that's where this is different, because this has an NH2. And then this just had an OH on it. And what happened is this would form an ester bond. Oops, uh, to a carbon. And then we'd get a big fatty acid. And so the sphingosine already sort of has that big long carbon chain built into it. And so this molecule very is very similar to glycerol in the shape but it's, it's a different backbone. So glycerol doesn't have the nitrogen on this position and also has to get a fatty acid attached to it, whereas sphingosine already has a big long hydrocarbon sh side chain and then it has a nitrogen group. So this oxygen, uh, this, this hydroxyl right here is gonna allow it to form a bond with phosphate. And so we are gonna see these type of structures right here. Let me clean this up a little bit. So anyways, I was trying to make the similarities um, between sphingosine and uh, uh, glycerol a little more apparent. But So that's the different backbone, sphingosine. And um, sphingosine, uh, sometimes what they do is when, when sphingosine has already been attached to a second well, I shouldn't say a second fatty acid, to a fatty acid, because it forms a bond to a fatty acid uh, at the nitrogen. So instead of an ester bond, this is an amide bond. And so if we get here, this whole little backbone, this is called a ceramide. And it's called a ceramide because this is what they, they find this structure in something they call cerebrosides found in the brain. And, and so cerebroside ceramide um, is where the name kind of comes from. Um, so the ceramide is just the backbone of the sphingosine attached to a fatty acid. Now when you take that and then you let that alcohol group react with a phosphate um, and that phosphate comes with an amino alcohol or um, it could be that ethanolamine or it can be that other molecule that we were just looking at. Um, this is what sphingomyelin is. And sphingomyelin, you may know, um, is very abundant in nerve cells. It's part of the plasma, uh, the lipid bilayer in our brain cells um, and nerve cells. And it's part of the ability to conduct um, the, that electrical signal um, from cell to cell. And so we, you know, if you know anyone with MS, uh, they have a, 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 an autoimmune disease that their own body sort of attacks their sphingomyelin and degrades it. Uh, which will eventually need lead to that nerve damage. Um, so sphingomyelin is an important uh, an important biological uh, sphingolipid. So um, that's why we look at the structure here. Uh, glycolipids are the last sort of class of, of complex lipid. Uh, glycolipids um, contain sugars on them. And so we find these um, as either um, cerebrosides, um, <coughs> excuse me, or something called gangliosides, which actually have a, a, a lot longer carbon um, groups on them um, and, and are often involved in signaling. Um, we, we're looking at some pictures in that plasma uh, membrane or that, um, that fluid mosaic picture that had those little little groups sticking up off of the uh, off of the proteins and, and those are these these uh, or not off the proteins rather off of the, the phosphate um, the little circles gosh I'll just draw it 
you can go back and look at the picture, but it was like these little, these little things growing off there like that. Those are the sugars. And that would make this thing uh, the glycolipid. So carbohydrates that are incorporated into glycolipids are usually glucose or galactose. Um, the cerebrosides are ceramide mono or oligosaccharides. That means that they have either one sugar or multiple sugars on them. Um, and they're showing us a picture here of glucocerebroside. So this is the ceramide. So sphingosine right here. And then the fatty acid is this right here. So this fatty acid and sphingosine together is the ceramide. And then instead of there being an OH, this has a glucose on it. And so this is now the glucocerebroside. Um, and so this molecule would be found, um, I guess, in the brains, in the brain, uh, brain cells and the lipid bilayer of the brain cells is where it gets its name. So the glycolipid. Okay. Steroids. This is the other classification of lipids. So these look nothing like the lipids that we were looking at. All the ones before had long, straight chain, you know, fatty acids in them. Or they had um, uh, a polar side and a non-polar side. These don't tend to have that. In fact, all of the steroid lipids are based off of this structure. There's a four ring structure. S three of them are six membered rings, one's a five membered ring. So this is the basic backbone. Cholesterol, the most abundant steroid. It's actually the precursor for all the steroid hormones and for bile acids. And we're going to look at um, both of those. Cholesterol plays a, a role within the, the lipid bilayer as well. It's involved in signaling in the lipid bilayer. It's involved in making it more fluid, making it more rigid. Um, if, if the lipid bilayer is, is subjected to too much temperature change, such as too much hot or cold, um, hot would make the lipid li uh, bilayer more, um, more fluid. It would be too, too wiggly with all the heat. Uh, then cholesterol is added to it to stabilize the hydrocarbon chains and pack them all together to kind of solidify it. If it's too cold and, and it needs to be more fluid, then cholesterol is removed from the bilayer. So it plays a role um, in that sense, but it also is a precursor, as I mentioned before, to some of the other hormones. And so it needs to be transported to different parts of the body where those transitions and those um, chemical reactions can take place. We're going to talk a little bit about cholesterol transport here in a second. So um, cholesterol is the precursor for the steroid hormones in that it gets converted into progesterone. And so uh, we didn't get a good, yeah, we did, sorry. Uh, I kind of skipped over the differences between cholesterol and the uh, steroid backbone. So let me back up a second. So here's cholesterol, here's our steroid backbone. Okay, what makes cholesterol is that it has this hydroxyl group, it's got some methyl groups, it's got a double bond, and then it's got this hydrocarbon chain. Okay, so that's cholesterol. We're going to talk about cholesterol esters in a little bit as well. And all that means is that this is going to get added to this other hydrocarbon group. And that's going to help with the transport of this molecule. Um, so that's, that's the reaction-wise of cholesterol, what we need to worry about. Just that, that well, we don't need to worry about it, really. But we're going to talk about cholesterol esters, and I don't think the book really shows a good picture of one. But all that is is a modification on cholesterol's hydroxyl group. Anyways, um, so this thing gets modified into progesterone. Um, the double bond on the OH here, um, some changes to the carbon, uh, the carbon chain there. And so progesterone is the precursor to the rest of these um, steroid hormones. It gets converted into testosterone, which can be converted into estradiol. Uh, and this is why, um, why men and women both have 
some levels of these things. Men have progesterone because it's the precursor to testosterone, which they make. Women have testosterone because it's the precursor to estradiol that they make. Um, it also, progesterone goes on to make cortisol. Uh, cortisol can be made into cortisone, and cortisone um, uh, is, well, sorry, and cortisol, uh, these are all similar in structure to aldosterone, which can be made from progesterone as well. We'll talk a, a little bit about what some of these do um, later on. So um, lipoproteins are proteins that transport these lipids. And um, we, we classify them a couple different ways. We say that there are chylomicrons, which um, carry tiny little proteins, uh, that they carry tiny little amounts of lipids around. We have um, very low density lipoproteins, which have more um, size to mass ratio, right? Think about what density means. I guess you don't really have to imagine that. Um, low density lipoproteins, we'll talk about, uh, about why this is bad. Um, for their size, 50% of it is cholesterol versus high density lipoproteins, um, which only have about 30% cholesterol. Um, function wise, there's a reason why HDL is considered good as well. HDL runs around and actually scoops up free cholesterol floating in your blood, whereas LDL may actually dump cholesterol into your blood, uh, depending on what your, um, your cell's cholesterol contents um, happen to be. Um, lipoproteins have to associate with cholesterol to transport it around uh, because <coughs> lipoproteins, uh, I'm sorry, cholesterol uh, is very hydrophobic doesn't like water. And so um, proteins have to associate with it in order to create something that is going to like some water enough to be able to dissolve and transport around inside your blood, or at least inside your blood serum. Um, and so we end up with these different um, associations of protein and fats. Your book goes into some good details about how each interacts with um, the cell. Um, for example, LDL actually recognizes receptors on the outside of cells. The cells then pull the um, LDL inside. Once it's inside, it can actually let go of all the cholesterol that it has and the other um, lipids it was transporting. Um, and then the little LDL goes back outside the cell for, for recycling or to be reused again. Um, uh, to tie this into to cholesterol and bad cholesterol and kind of health, if you have too much cholesterol, what, what happens is your cells actually stop making the receptor that LDL will recognize to be able to get inside your cell and deliver the cholesterol. And so since it's now floating around with nowhere to go, it starts to just dump cholesterol into your arteries or your veins, um, and then it builds up as plaques or it can depending on if you've got a lot of enough HDL floating around. Um, I, think, uh, I think the slides here go into some of these details. Wow, this was a really good picture. I wish I had shown this sooner. So this is an LDL, um, and the protein that's associated with these um, lipids. Um, these lipids, you can see, are just associating together through hydrophobic interaction. So we've got um, the hydrophobic tails, we've got the protein, we've got cholesterol esters on the inside. These are especially um, hydrophobic. We've got phospholipids in purple that make up a lot of the, the polar bit of the outside here. And then some unesterified cholesterol. Now remember some cholesterol uh, that we looked at had those hydroxyl groups on them, on that one particular end of the, I'm just gonna draw a really, really bad cholesterol molecule, but this is the polar bit that would be sticking up. So that's how these things associate together. And then again, it's low density, um, meaning that it doesn't weigh very much. When we get to the high density, there's a lot less of space and a lot more sort of heavy things, maybe more protein, less of the, the, um, the lipids. And so that's just why they call it High density versus low density. 
So cholesterol, uh, transport of cholesterol from the liver starts out as a very low density particle. As the fat gets removed, the density increases. There you go. And it becomes low density. Uh, this low density floats around in your body for about 2.5 days on average. Uh, carries the cholesterol to the cells where receptors bind to it. And I was telling you about those receptors. Now, high density lipoproteins we didn't talk about. Um, these transport cholesterol from the tissues to the liver. Um, in the liver, they're going to get co uh, converted into um, the steroid hormones. And it also transfers cholesterol to LDL for uh, transport to other parts of the body. Um, while it's in it, the HDL form, uh, it's being converted to cholesterol esters. Let's see, in the liver, it binds to the liver cell surface and transfers the cholesterol esters into the cell. And these esters are used for the synthesis of both steroid hormones and the bile acids. And we'll look at the bile acids in a second. We haven't talked about those. Um, and then after the HDL has delivered its cholesterol payload, it returns into the serum and does some more cholesterol delivering. Most of the cholesterol is carried by LDL. So if you have a lot of LDL, um, typically when you're uh, at risk of heart disease or um, atherosclerosis or something like that, they go and they look at how much LDL to HDL you have. Um, and they use that as a measure of if you, you know, have too much cholesterol. Now you can make cholesterol from other sources, protein and carbohydrate sources. So if you, you know, simply, um, you know, don't eat uh, certain foods that are high in cholesterol, but you eat a lot of fatty foods in general, you're going to end up making um, plenty and uh, getting plenty of cholesterol from those other sources. So um, I guess I'm specifically talking about the bad rap that like eggs got at one point because they do have a lot of cholesterol in them, but you only get a part of the cholesterol that's in something you eat anyways. You don't, it doesn't all go into your body. You get some of it, um, but but again, you can if you don't have enough, you're gonna you're gonna make it on your own, anyways. So um, so yeah, you you should just have a healthy, balanced diet, and not just avoid foods that are high in cholesterol for the fact that they're high in cholesterol. Um, it, it it's more you know complicated than that. Um, okay, so this is sort of talking about what I mentioned earlier uh, about how. Having too much cholesterol is essentially bad for us. Oops, sorry. Um, you can read more about cholesterol in your book. All right, some steroid hormones. So there's the, um, the male sex hormones. These are synthesized in the testes from cholesterol, uh, responsible for the development of secondary male characteristics. Um, these, this testosterone is also the one that, um, builds muscle. And so, uh, guys that want to, you know, get really big, really fast, uh, can take testosterone, but it leads to some sort of secondary male characteristic side effects. So there are some synthetic hormones, these, um, uh, what do they call them? Anabolic steroids, uh, that people take anabolic meaning kind of body building because catabolic um, is breaking down and anabolic is, is building up. That, that's the two sides of metabolism. Um, so the anabolic steroids that are slightly variations of testosterone uh, tend to help um, bulk up a lot faster. Um, and here are some of those, those synthetic steroids. You can see how they're somewhat similar in structure I mean, they all have the steroid backbone, um, but testosterone has the carbonyl carbon, and these guys also have carbonyls. With some variations uh, to these groups. Uh, the female sex hormones, these are uh, responsible for regulating uh, the, the menstrual cycle. Um, they play roles in whether or not um, uh, 
uh, a newly formed fetus will be able to develop you know, or attach. Um, and so we can take advantage of these structures. Um, I believe um, similar structures are used in, in birth control uh, pills or in, in, you know, essentially the, the pill um, is just a, a, a variation of progesterone um, that, that has the effects of you know, preventing um, any kind of pregnancy. And I think it just works better than progesterone. Progesterone would work, but you know, we, we like to make things that are similar and work better. So I believe the molecule, the, the active one in birth control is a variation of progesterone. Uh, yeah, progesterone-like. Of course, this one's quite a variation, it's got this big group on it. Glutico, uh, glucocorticoid hormones. So these are the ones that regulate um, your glucose and glycogen levels. I'm trying to think of the other type of um, hormones that there was. Give me a second. It was... Oh, yeah. Okay, so the adrenocorticoid hormones. There's two types. Um, there's the mineral corticoids and the glucocorticoids. The mineral corticoids regulate your, your ions. So like sodium, potassium, or, or sodium and chlorine um, to help regulate potassium. Um, and then the glucocorticoids are the ones that regulate glucose and glycogen. Um, and so if your glucose and glycogen levels are low, these things kick in to start breaking down your glycogen um, into glucose or to start synthesizing glucose from protein or fat sources. Um, they, of course it says that right there. They can also decrease inflammation um, and are involved in stress. And aldosterone is an example of this glucocorticoid Bile salts. So this is the other class of um, molecules that are made from those cholesterol esters that are delivered to the liver by HDL. Um, bile salts are made um, and stored so that you can digest food you eat that has high fat content or fat content. So um, just how soap works to break up grease so that water can dissolve it and wash it away. When you eat fats, you need something that's going to help dissolve them in your blood and dissolve them into the water cell environment that you want to take them into. And so um, these bile salts are emulsifying agents. They have big sort of nonpolar regions and then some polar regions. Um, and this is going to help them help you um, ingest those fats. Some people have their gallbladders removed. So the storage of bile salts has been de deplenished, um, and so they have a harder time metabolizing or digesting high-fat foods. They can take um, bile salt supplements, um, but you still make your own bile salts um, in the liver. So unless you have liver damage, um, you still have some bile salts, even if you can't store them in the gallbladder. And again, these are um, based on cholesterols, sort of um, same shape, um, but again, they're all steroids because they're of that, that same um, backbone of the rings that they have. So this is the other kind of lipids. Now prostaglandins, um, is it prostaglandins? Um, there was three. Uh, prostaglandins, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes. That's what we're going to talk about now. So these guys all come um, from uh, arachidonic acid. Um, and I think your book does say that somewhere. Um, well, or their they're derivatives are of, of arachidonic acid. Um, uh, this says prostanoic acid, but we'll see what the difference is here in a second. Um, so a family of compounds, they have these bonds that end up forming a little ring here 
um, without that, you can imagine that this would just be a big, long, straight chain. So not stored in the tissue, synthesized from the membrane brown 20 carbon and poly polyunsaturated fatty acids um, when they're needed. So they're not stored as prostaglandins. Basically, our bodies let this guy and other, I guess, other fatty acids like this guy float around uh, until needed. And when they are needed, an enzyme will go and turn this into a prostaglandin. So uh, I think up here we could see which carbon was connecting. So 8 connected to 12. So something's going to come in here when needed and form a double bond or form a bond here. And then it's turned into a prostaglandin. Now, prostaglandins um, are associated with, with the pain response, associated with inflammation. They also have a role to play in, in, in muscle contraction. Um, so one of the um, one of the ways that um, like like aspirin works is that they uh, they go and they inhibit the enzyme that turns the arachidonic acid into a prostaglandin. And so there's a few types. Your book goes through the different. Um, uh, the different um, enzymes, I think there's two, um, and then different types of prostaglandins and different tissues and whatnot. But you can see they have slightly different structures. Um, this one has a hydroxyl, this is a ketone group. Um, so different parts of the body, they probably do slightly different things. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that's what NSAIDs are. Um, and anti-inflammatory in the sense that in this one is going and blocking the production of this guy, which would have made these guys, which is going to produce some sort of inflammatory response. Um, so COX-1, normal physiological production of prostaglandins. Uh, COX-2, uh, production of prostaglandins and inflammation. So um, it looks like when you get uh, tissue damage or get injured, um, something's going to turn on this enzyme and make prostaglandins. So it would make sense if you were going to make a drug that was uh, an anti-inflammatory, you would want it to go and inhibit this guy. Let's see. The other class is the th thromboxane. Um, you can see this similar structure here. Um, this has a, a neat little ring, separate ring feature in there. Um, so thrombox thromb thromboxanes, what you need to know about those is that they're involved in um, blood clotting. Let's just, let's just call it that, blood clotting. Um, you can read the book a little bit on, on how they're involved in blood clotting. Um, and then leukotrienes, these are the last ones. Um, these, so named because they're found in the white blood cells, um, they're involved in muscle contractions, especially like in the lungs as like um, anti-inflammatory and sort of allergy responses. So um, these guys, when, when, when made, uh, trigger those muscle contractions, so the coughing that you would get. Um, histamine does the same thing. These guys are way more potent. So nowadays, um, you know, drugs that are meant to, to prevent those sort of reactions um, focus on the inhibition of these particular compounds, these leukotrienes. Um, so again, these are lipids that are either used in plasma membranes. So let's kind of summarize it. I think we're towards the end of this anyways. Yeah, so let's summarize it. We've got um, lipids that are simple. And these are the fatty acids and the waxes. And then we had our complex ones. Triglycerides. We have our phosphoglycerides. Or phosphoacylglycerides or whatever other name we can come up with that describes the same thing. We have our, uh, we could say phospholipids, right? I guess that works. This just means they have phosphate groups. We have our sphingolipids. This just means they have sphingosine instead of glycerol. We have our glycolipids.
Um, that just means that they have uh, sugar molecules on them. Let's see, what else? Oh, and then these guys, the steroids. Um, so cholesterol, the sex hormones, the um, uh, cortisol, cortisone, aldosterone. I don't think we talked much about cortisol or at all about cortisol. Um, oh, other than, yeah, we, we didn't talk about it, but it was the, uh, the, um, the glucocorticoid, glucocorticoid. So these are the ones that regulate the glucose metabolism, glucose metabolism. Lipids, glycerophospholipids, uh, glycolipids. I think I was trying to, uh, I guess I was going to remind you guys what a ceramide was. That's just the phenocene when it has a fatty acid attached. Uh, maybe that was it. Okay, well, I guess that is the end, the end of this, uh, this lecture here. Um, I'll be opening up a discussion um, on Canvas. You guys can post any questions you have there. Um, obviously this material goes into a lot of um, more detail than I went into you don't have to go into all the same details um, if you read the text um, it should answer some of the questions that you might have um, so definitely take a look at the text but um, you know this is more of an or overview than, than learning specific details about how these lipids react or how these lipids are formed Okay, so we focus on the classifications, focus on the structural differences, meaning contains phosphate, doesn't contain phosphate, has a sugar, doesn't have a sugar. Okay, that's what I mean. Um, and then, um, you know, know, uh, know the terms. If you look in your book, there should be some bolded terms. Know those. Um, uh, and beyond that, I think that should do it. So um, I will be posting a quiz and um, working on the next, the next video. I think the next one's amino acids.